Hello everyone, and welcome back. I'm the Lunar Librarian, and today I'll be covering a case from Belgium, the unsolved murder of the eight-year-old Jean van Kalk, also known as the Rue de Hirondelle murder, for the street Jean's body was found on, Van Kalk's brutal and unsolved slaying shook the city of Brussels to its core. It also stands as an important example in the development and history of forensics. Due to a series of investigative mistakes, as well as a general lack of evidence in the case, the crime remains unsolved to this day, a fact which caused considerable outrage among the Belgian public for years after the killing. Before we begin, I'd like to give a warning. This video will mention child sexual abuse, as well as homicide against a child. If that isn't something you want to hear about, then stop watching now. With that said, this is the Rue de Hirondelle murder. Jeanne van Kalk was born on September 17, 1897, in the city of Brussels. Jeanne's father, a typographer for Le Soir, a newspaper in Brussels, had abandoned Jeanne and her mother, Francois, either before she was born or right after. For most children, this would all but guarantee an incredibly difficult life. Early 20th century Belgium was not a particularly easy place for single mothers to live and raise children. Employment opportunities for women at the time were considerably limited, usually consisting of poorly paid domestic labor. This meant that supporting oneself as a single woman was a difficult prospect, let alone supporting a child as well. Francois was certainly no exception to this, and by 1906, she was no longer able to support both her and her daughter. Instead, Jan went to live with her grandparents sometime before or during early 1906. While Jeanne was no longer living with her mother, she was not estranged from her either. Francois lived only a short walk from her parents' house, and so Jeanne and her grandfather would pay her mother daily visits after her grandfather got off work. The pair had done this almost every day since Jeanne had moved out of her mother's home, and she was apparently very close to Francois, despite the physical separation between them. Jeanne had always made the walk to her mother's house, accompanied by her grandfather. But on February 7, 1906, her grandfather was stuck at work late and unable to escort her. Jeanne, however, was insistent upon seeing her mother, and Francois' residence was only a short walk away from her grandparents' home. Since her grandfather was still at work, and Jeanne had walked this route numerous times already, her grandmother believed that Jan was finally old enough to make the journey on her own. And so, at approximately 6.30 p.m. on February 7, 1906, Jan van Kalk departed from her grandparents' home. This was the last time she would be seen alive. Just before midnight that same day, Joseph Eilenbosch, a local machinist, discovered a suspicious package outside the door of 22 Rue de Hirondelle. Thinking this was odd, he and his son notified the police. Officers Gustave Van Damme and Pierre Noel were sent out to the house to investigate, but ultimately decided to bring the package back to the police station before opening it. Noel would ultimately be the one to open the package. Inside, he would discover the body of Jeanne van Kalk. She had been stripped naked, with her clothing placed inside the package alongside her, and coroners discovered indicators of sexual abuse on her body. In addition to this, Jeanne's legs had been amputated post-mortem and were not present alongside the rest of her remains. Importantly, this amputation was done very well which made police believe that her killer had to be either a butcher or a surgeon, as those professions had ready access to the tools required for such an amputation, as well as possessing the skill to perform it. Possibly most significantly, Van Kalk's body was still warm when it was brought to the police station, suggesting she had been killed only a few hours before she had been discovered, likely around 8 to 9 p.m. <laughs> 
Brussels police immediately began investigating the murder. The coroner who examined her body determined that the cause of death was suffocation following aspiration of vomit. Van Kalk had been forced by her killer to drink a considerable amount of alcohol, which had caused her to vomit violently, some of which had been aspirated into her lungs, causing Van Kalk to choke to death. It was the amputation of her limbs that gave police the greatest insight into her murderer. Her legs were removed cleanly. They had been surgically amputated, as I mentioned earlier, not just haphazardly cut off. From this, the coroner concluded that her killer was either a doctor or a butcher, as I mentioned earlier, and that whoever had removed her legs had prior experience with the amputation of human limbs. Police's first course of action was to begin looking for Van Kalk's legs, hoping they would offer more evidence. Police trawled canals and searched the neighborhoods of Brussels for ten days, looking for the child's legs, until they were discovered packaged similarly to her torso by a gardener on February 16th. However, Van Kalk's legs did not offer police anything new to work with. Police also sent a dog and handler, hoping that the sent dog could lead them to the site of Jeanne's murder. The intention was that finding where Jeanne had been killed could be vital to discovering who had killed her. However, 22 Rue de Hirondelle was not particularly far from where Jeanne lived and walked with her grandfather almost every day. As a result, police dogs only ever offered false positives. Instead of leading police to the site of Jeanne's murder, the dogs instead led investigators to her grandparents' house. Jeanne lived in the neighborhood, played outside around the area, and went on daily walks with her grandfather, meaning her scent was all over the neighborhood and most concentrated around her grandparents' home. As a result, dogs were only ever able to track her back to that location meaning police never actually discovered where Jeanne was killed. Police also consulted the then-emergent field of forensic science, but the deliberate placement of Jeanne's body meant that early forensics were largely unprepared to offer anything. In the early 1900s, forensic science consisted of methods such as ballistics and fingerprint analysis, alongside toxicology all of which were relatively new methods of criminal investigation in Western Europe. Since police never uncovered any usable fingerprints, these methods offered little evidence, although toxicological analysis helped the coroner determine how Jeanne died. Desperate for answers, a 20,000 franc reward was offered for any information on the killer, but according to the Brussels police, no witnesses ever came forward. A few suspects would be arrested over the course of the investigation, but all were eventually released. Two unnamed suspects, alongside a Dr. Nysens, were arrested at various points in the investigation, although none of these interrogations evidently led anywhere. An additional suspect, Jean Meny, was considered the most likely suspect in the crime. Meny was apprenticed to a butcher, meaning he had the technical skills to have amputated Van Kalk's legs. However, while Manny may have had the skills to have committed the crime, this incidental connection was the only piece of evidence against him. Instead, it seems more likely that he was himself a victim of police profiling. Manny was incredibly poor. He apparently had no regular housing, and whenever he was not working as a butcher, he could be found begging in the streets of Brussels, something which maybe gave him more suspicion in the eyes of the police than he deserved. Manny was evidently arrested and interrogated, although no definitive connection between him and Jeanne was ever established. While Manny certainly could have been involved in Van Kalk's disappearance, it is more likely his occupation, coupled with his financial distress, made him an easy target for police looking to solve the crime quickly.
The idea that Meni was profiled is made more believable by the fact that Brussels police mishandled the Van Kalk investigation in numerous other ways. Brussels police were subject to public scrutiny throughout the investigation. The murder of an eight-year-old child understandably sparked public outrage, outrage which placed increased pressure on investigators to deliver results. Outrage over Jeanne's death was so intense that Francois and her family needed a full police detail to keep the general public away from Jeanne's funeral. This level of public scrutiny undoubtedly made it more difficult for investigators to work, especially when the general outrage turned into anger at the investigators' lack of progress. Belgian newspapers frequently criticized the police and their lack of headway into the case. While some of this criticism may have been unwarranted, some of it was evidently justified. A French lawyer, Louis Frank, somehow got a hold of the police files relating to Van Kalk's murder in 1909, prompting him to publish a book criticizing the police investigation, citing 29 specific faults with their methodology. Perhaps the most significant of these failures was that Brussels police had actively ignored the only witness who had come forward. An unnamed friend of Jeanne's had apparently seen her after she left her grandparents' house on February 7th. This friend had reported that Jeanne was walking the opposite direction of her mother's house with an unidentified man that Jeanne seemed to trust. Evidently, Jeanne's friend had told this information to the police However, because the source of this was a seven-year-old girl, Brussels police opted to ignore this testimony entirely. This means that police apparently had been given at least one lead. However, they chose not to follow up on it in any way. This was not the only case of police negligence in this investigation. However, this one fact alone calls into question the competence of police investigating the murder and suggests that the crime was not solved, at least in part, because the Brussels police had not explored the leads they had been given. That being said, it should be noted that even if police had listened to Jeanne's friend, there is no guarantee the investigation would have ended any more conclusively. Murders rarely go unsolved because of one single factor and in this instance, police negligence was only one of the factors that caused Jeanne Van Kalk's murder to go unsolved. One seven-year-old witness does not automatically undo the reality that there was remarkably little forensic evidence available to police, or that Jeanne's killer had evidently struck in a planned and methodical way so as to avoid capture. Indeed, she may not have been her killer's only victim. A year after Jeanne was murdered, the body of another child, Annette Bellot, was discovered in extremely similar circumstances to Jeanne. Police never established if these killings were related, although the similar age and condition of the two girls suggests that they could be. Like Van Kalk, Bellot's murder also went unsolved. If these two deaths were connected, which seems at least plausible, then it is likely whoever killed them understood how to avoid being arrested for their crimes. The conclusion that can be drawn from this is that the Brussels police almost certainly mishandled the investigation of Jeanne Van Kalk's murder in some way. But it is unclear if this mishandling is the reason they were unable to solve that murder. The police certainly deserve some criticism for ignoring what was at the time their only lead but there is no guarantee that lead would have meant anything, even if it had been followed. In 1906, most modern forensic technology either didn't exist or existed only in an experimental form. Fingerprint analysis was still an emergent field, having only been implemented in Western criminology in the late 1800s. Likewise, DNA wasn't properly understood until the 1950s, and wouldn't be used in criminal investigations until the 1980s. This meant that investigators couldn't really search for DNA evidence, and quite possibly didn't know to look for fingerprints. Without these methods, 
investigators relied on witnesses, sniffing dogs, and chemical analysis, all of which was either absent or considered unreliable by police in this case. As a result, murder was considerably easier to get away with in 1906, in general, than it is today, something which held true in the case of Jeanne van Kalk. Ultimately, police would quietly abandon the investigation by 1909, meaning Frank's book criticizing the investigators would mark the end of what had become a very high-profile criminal case. Jeanne van Kalk had been elevated to the status of a martyr for her community, seen as a symbol of lost innocence throughout Belgium. Le Soir, the newspaper her father worked at, even took donations to construct a marble monument to the young girl. Nonetheless, the public profile around her murder did little to ultimately help solve it, and Jeanne van Kalk's murder remains entirely unsolved to this day. I've been the Lunar Librarian. If you want to see more historical true crime content, feel free to check out the playlist I've linked in the description below. Otherwise, thank you for watching if you're still here, and until next time, goodbye.